the FBI is like, you know, calling me back and forth, and they're like, I was involved with their pump and dump stuff, and like another one, their telecommunications company at this point, and their bookmaking, and and uh, so the FBI called me back, and they said, uh, has Eddie been calling you? And I said, yeah, he wants to meet me up here in Toronto. He's going to come drive up here. And they're like, you didn't tell him where you were, did you? And I go, are you kidding me? I told him I was downtown at the Hyatt, and I was completely the opposite side of town. You know what I mean? Not a group of my so they're like, okay, you better sit back. So I ended up staying in Canada. It's like, you know, that was it. That was the end of my time on the street. But I didn't tell, they didn't tell anyone. They left my cell phone on. And then I just, I kept calling people back saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm in California right now. And, and uh, I'm coming back. You know what I mean? Right. We did. So they wanted to keep this, keep the facade up that I was still coming back. Right. So, so, so hopefully that they, you know, they could pick them up still calling you or whatever, leaving messages yeah, or whatever. Yeah, people still called me for months. So, so how long did they leave your phone on after you went into witness protection? Um, I wasn't even in witness protection. I was under protection of the FBI at this point. And, oh, okay. Uh, right, right, right. Right, for yeah. Like another, for like another six or eight months. Unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> They're probably like, what the hell happened to this guy? He fell off the face of the earth. In, in, in your book, you have a photo with, with William Cotolo Sr., did, did you know him when you were in Miami? Did you ever, did you meet him or deal with him at all? No, I dealt with his guys. Okay, his guys, his, his crew. Um, like, Joe Campy's my friend. Um, I'm friends with his son. Billy, yeah, Billy, but right. Him, yeah, but I didn't deal with him then, you know, like, I, but I know a lot of his guys. Right, so you didn't, you didn't know Billy when you were, like, dealing with the Colombo guys at all at that no, point? No, I'm going to deal with the crew. I'm going to deal with the crew. Totally gets that Right, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I, they, knew all their, I knew all their people because they're all friends. Right, right. Well, even... That's what's so weird. They're all friends. Everyone grew up with each other. Right, they did. Well, and it's funny because I know you're you're a mutual friend with, with Andrew, too. And Andrew yeah. and Andrew grew up with, with uh, you know, Persico's and then, you know, was telling me that he grew up with, uh, obviously, with the Gambino guys, too, the Carrazzo, you know, Carrazzo's yeah. and stuff, too. So it's just crazy because, you know... You know, guys that I've interviewed or guys that I know, you know, they all grow up in these pretty tight boroughs like Queens and and places like that. And there's just so many of those guys that grow up around each other, you know, and then they grow up either dealing with each other or being enemies with each other. It's it's just kind of crazy, you know. Yeah, that's what happened. Like, oh, like, well, just like that guy, Craig, that we were going to go shoot for Teddy. Um, Craig was with uh, Joe Scopo and he was with the, you know, the Cotolo uh, side. Same right. with John Bonanza. John Bonanza was, and then he ended up marrying into the Lucchese family. Okay. And, uh, yeah, he married um, Danny. Uh, oh, man, I can't remember. Danny, uh, he's on the panel with it, of the uh, Lucchese family. Is it? Uh, he married his daughter. It, uh, Katea? Yeah, Danny Katea. He made Dad marry Danny Katea's daughter. Oh, okay. Interesting. When Danny Katea was in prison, John became his captain. Right. So he so did he he moved over to the Lucchese family. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because really, you know, and I, that's what a lot of people don't realize. Even after those Colombo, after the, the last Colombo War ended, you know, the guys that were still on the arena side that were still alive, you know, it's almost like the Persicos never forgave them. You know, and it's almost, no, never. It, that's, why we, that's why that hit was going to go down anyway. That whole thing is because Craig and those guys tried to kill Teddy's dad, really. Wow. Interesting. So that was all. That was after the war had ended, and they basically were going to pay him back for that. Of course. That's right. what he said. Right. And that's, and, and, you know, and that's obviously what happened to Billy's father, too. You know, I mean, he... Correct. You know, unfortunately. So, you know. Um, so, okay. So let's... Uh, let, I mean, I really wanted to talk about kind of what you have going on now. You know, I know you're, I mean, I, I, I've kept up with you, you know, on Facebook and everything. I know you've been really involved in mixed martial arts. Um, you know, I, I've always read your blog. Um, it says that you're doing, you know, that you're doing like Christian writing now too. Yeah, what what I did is um, after I left, I, uh, you know, got my first real job in my whole life. Uh-huh. You know, I worked in, I was in, the, I had a mortgage, I was in the mortgage business. And I oh, was, cool. Uh, and then I was in, uh, I, I was in commodity, I worked for a real commodities firm for MF Global. Uh-huh. And then, um, after the, like, my book came out, like, we, we wrote my book, and uh, I worked on it hard. Then, 
And my book came out, and I went up to, I moved to Los Angeles, and I started working in Hollywood, and I wanted to screenwrite. So I started screenwriting, and I ended up selling, you know, I not only sold my book to Fox, but I sold another project I did to, um, to the History Channel, so I worked on that for like, you know, a year. I had another one, I got the WGA that way. And um, I worked for other people for, um, you know, writing and, and doing stuff like that. And then in between that, I always train mixed martial arts. I've been training martial arts for a long time. I've been out of box a long time ago. Right. But, um, I, start, I started working at a uh, place in Orange County, California, called Ray, Ray Training Center. Mm-hmm. And then Mark Munoz of that, the UFC guy. I knew Mark before he even went to UFC. And I started training like with all the world champions down there and taught there. And um, I did jiu-jitsu, and um, I eventually gave my black belt in jiu-jitsu. And then I, I, I um, when I moved to L.A., I would go to the marks every once in a while still. But I started training at Fortune's Gym, uh, Fortune Gym, with Justin Fortune, who trains Manny Pacquiao. Right. And I worked for him for six years. And, uh, you know, I trained people for him. I trained fighters, I trained world champions. And um, I just really liked it. And I just came to a point where I got really burned out. Mm-hmm. on life in, in Hollywood and um, I thought there's much more and I, you know, I became a Christian and I just put left that life behind. I decided one time that I'm just going to move. I moved to Illinois and I decided I wanted to uh, just just quit that. I just I don't want to write about the mob anymore. Right. I burned out on it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of writing about criminals. They're all the same. And so I just you know, I'm a Christian, so I started, I started writing my, my Christian book. I, I finished it. Um, it's just editing right now. And um, I started writing my, a Christian blog and then, and then getting more into fitness and, like, training, training Parkinson's patients. I train older people. I, I train them, you know, I train them boxing through Rock City Boxing and my other programs. Right. And um, I help people out. And that's just, it's just, to me, is more fulfilling than, you know, working in Hollywood. It's what for me. Right. And, uh, I just I just kept going doing the right thing, man, and working so I got to do my own thing every day. Um, you know, like that's something I didn't do before. Like I was really steady doing stuff, I was dedicated, but I wasn't like on the right path. Now I'm on the right path. I do my thing. I uh, I'm you know, I don't I don't I never really drank, so I don't drink, I don't eat any bad food. I you know, I just eat I'm a plant plant based um, athlete that's all i do is i eat plants i don't eat meat i mean i'm in terrific shape and i train people i went to uh i went with with uh, my church to israel this year for 12 days got baptized in the jordan river i've been baptized before but not you know not israel <laughs> but the jordan river and right. um i just you know i surrendered myself and i ever since then you know my life has totally changed my outlook in life has changed Right, and, you know, things work out. Things have worked out. I mean, I made a promise to the FBI and myself in 1996 that I would never commit any more crime again. I had, right? And, uh, that's the way I'm gonna keep it. And uh, you know, and I decided that I was worth more than um, just like you know, working, slaving away for like, making money in my idol and slaving away in Hollywood for money. You know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna do some stupid reality show. Right. All they, I write all these stupid shows that aren't even true. All they do is like glorify all these people, and they make it look like it's one way. They're like, oh, what do you mean? Like, you, you know, would you just come up and threaten someone? I go, no, I never would do that. No one would do that. No real guy. They don't act like that. And so they tell you that they want to hear the truth. Then when you get there, you tell them the truth. They don't want to hear it. Right. Well, well, it's it's interesting. First of all, I, I do work in the film industry too. I, I do underscoring, so it's it's a different yeah. side of things. But um, but I understand how things work, and you know, and dealing with producers and, and different things. But um, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, and he he was uh, an associate in the Gambino family, and um, obviously he's turned his life around, and, and he's doing really well now but um he uh <clears throat> he was telling me you know because he's done you know shows on like a and e and the history channel and stuff where they want to know about the Gotti family and different things and of course he can give them insight on on Gotti jr because he was in his crew and um you know but unfortunately he said the same thing he's like you know every time i try to tell them the truth they have sold this fictional story 
uh, of, of John Gotti Sr. as this Robin Hood type character and and every time someone tries to tell them the truth, of course they're, they're going to manipulate that and not put that out there because they've sold him as one way for so long that they're not going to turn around and say, oh, well, we were wrong and he really was a scumbag or, or whatever the case may be, you know? So um, it's interesting because you're right, you know? About yeah, that's all they want to do is like make, and like they always like want to show the Bobcat, well, wasn't that guy wear a suit? I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Who, dude, we're going to go do work. Right. You think you guys going to wear a three-piece suit? No one ever wears a three-piece suit. John Gotti did because he was like in love with Al Capone. Right. Everyone else, nobody did. And I go, you got to remember John Gotti, that's like this 80s. Right. You know, I go, like, when I was a kid, man, my mom used to dress me up in a suit to fly on an airplane. Right. Well, those days are over. Right. My dad used to wear a suit to work. Everyone did. Right. You know, people wear t-shirts and jeans now. That's how, like, you, it's ridiculous. You have a Bob guy with a machine gun. Wearing a suit, right? With a with a, to, with a Tommy gun, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, but they always like this is this is what they always want to portray, and they right. always say that's not how it goes. And I go, you don't point a weapon at somebody. I go, if you want to have a gun, you have a pistol. You you show it to somebody, you use it. Otherwise, what what's the point? Right, absolutely. And they're like, oh, so you're saying that if I had a gun, I'd go take it, I'd take it away from you. Right. Beat the crap out of you, and I'll go. Oh, that's a free thousand dollars for me. I just took you. I just took your gun, and wallet, and your watch. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> right. And this, but, but these people, they like, couldn't get it. They couldn't grasp it. Like I was trying to tell them, like they like make up these movies. Like they make Mickey Cohen to be on this gangster. This guy was a bookmaker. Right. He didn't. He didn't take on the mob. He got like six of his guys killed. All you have to do is read the last mob Yoko by Jimmy Fallon, and you can read about that. All those guys. They make, they make up this stupid movie with uh, uh, Kim Basinger. Everyone gave it all this acclaim. Uh, uh, what was the name of that? The Kim Basinger movie. Was uh, it Was it L.A. Confidential? Yeah, L.A. Confidential. And right. they showed Mickey Cohen killed the two Tony. No, that was the L.A. mob family freaking hit. Jimmy Fratiano and, and Charlie Bass shot him in the back of the head of the car. Right. They didn't shoot him with a Tommy gun to the front of the window. I mean, it's like, dude, it's like common knowledge. You well, just make that up. And like you try to, like, they well, do that to all these things. Right. Well, it's like you said, they glamorize that life. You know, they try to make everything into, like, a Godfather-type movie. You know what I mean? When, when they interview me, I tell them like this. There's no happy endings in right. this life, in that life. There's no happy endings. Just like the porn life with the porn girls. There's no happy endings. There's no Cinderella stories. There's nothing good that comes out of it. Right. The only thing that you can do is change your life and get out. Right. Other than that, like even the guys were like, "Well, this guy." Like people used to argue with me online all the time. I just like delete them because they're like, "Oh, you're saying that there's no good things." I'm like, well, that guy had like a lot of money. I go, "Yeah, but look what happened to his son. Look what happened to his daughter." You know what I mean? Like, it's just right. They don't. They don't get what I'm saying. Like, they don't. There's no goodness that comes out. Of right. This. Not not material. Not material, tangible right. items. Because at the end of the day, everybody dies and everybody leaves with nothing. It's not. That's not what you're trying to convey. You're trying to convey life. You know, positive right. living or anything. You know, um, absolutely. What good, what good is it if your dad goes to prison or, or disappears and gets killed? Right. What good is money. Right. How about if you're a dad and you do a hundred years in prison? And you never see your kids, and they grow up, they die, and everything, and you see them lose the Well, like, how's that successful? Right. Oh, I gave them money? Like, how's that? Right, right, you absolutely. Know? And, like, and that's, and that's what I, that's, and that, that's the thing, that's, I had to change back to when I got out, because I was still a gangster, just not committing crimes. I was trying to make as much money as possible and live that life, and basing my life on money. And right. it's just, it's just not the right way to do things. Right. Absolutely. Well, I mean, ultimately, you know, it's like when you can physically change things, but it's like if you're not emotionally changing things or spiritually yeah. changing things, then really, what have you really changed? You know, I As, changed nothing. I changed right. my surroundings and I just took out the crime part, but I'm still the miserable person that I was before. Right. Well, you know, I, I, one thing I wanted to point out um, was, and, and I tabbed this in your book, um, when we we're, you know, when we we're set this interview up last week, I was um, thumbing through your books. I remember reading this, and uh, it it was uh, uh, like a little passage you wrote, and it uh, was from a 2004, I guess, like a note to self that you discovered in one of your old cell phones, and it said um, it was like almost like a to do list you made for yourself back then, but for like a to-do list for something that you, you know, that you ultimately wanted to accomplish. 
and 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 you know it kind of resonated with me because it basically said you know get a new career you know and then I started thinking I'm like well he's obviously done that and then it said write a book you know start to finish well obviously you've done that and then it says uh, start a new life which obviously now you have truly done that. Oh, and then it said have an adult relationship, and I started thinking about that, and you know, and you got married, you've gotten married, and everything. Which con- congratulations, by the way. And Thank you. Um, so you know, it's like, and then and then like the last thing it said only do good, and it, and it's like so you know when you're saying that you got away from you know like the vampires in Hollywood, and you've kind of removed yourself from that because that's a, that's one thing I try to explain. To, you know, a couple of, you know, guys that were formerly, in, you know, associates of the mob or, you know, members of the mob or whatever, when I've done interviews with them and, you know, and they've, you know, they put out a book and they're hoping that their book can sell and be made into a movie and et cetera, et cetera. And it's like I explained to them, I'm like, first of all, it's like things were different when Henry Hill sold his story to make Goodfellas. I'm like, there's so many guys on the street and, and all of y'all have extraordinary stories, but there's so much of it. And, and, and you know, and, and you have to understand too that the film industry is, is hurting. I mean, our economy is not good. And, and, you know, they can only fund so many. I mean, uh, uh, in today's standards, a $50 million film is, is a low budget film in Hollywood standards, you know, so it's like they can only do so much. So it's like I tell them, it's like, you know, you know, and I understand, you know, with some guys, they can't figure out things to do. They're trying, they're almost basically starting over. And that's another thing that I found extraordinary with you is it's like you've been able to adapt in all of these different settings that you've been in. And that now that you've been able to get away from Hollywood, it seems like you've kind of found your true happiness away from it all, you know? Well, here's the deal. Like, I taught myself how to write. Right. You, you can't, like, you can't be around that anyway. Dude, I, I, and I don't care if my book ever gets made into a movie. I'm, right. Like, like, I sold it already. Right. I got it back. I sold it again. I don't even deal with it anymore. I don't even take, I don't even take the phone calls because I don't care. Right. Like, they don't want to make it with a Japanese guy. They don't want to make it real life. I'm not interested. You right. don't want to pay me money. You want a no money option? Forget it. Right. You know, and I hear that all the time too. You know, we don't. You know why you don't have any? You know why Hollywood's hurting? Because they don't make movies that people want to watch. They want to make a comic book movie that everyone goes and watches. And and re and, goes and, watch. and rehashed movies. Like it's yeah. like who, who the hell wants to see? A remake of Footloose. I mean, th- that's where we've come to. It's like everything is remade. Right. Yeah. But they want, what they're trying to do, though, is they're trying to get it. They want like a sure thing. Get their, that's that, like trying to make like we'll work hard and doing something good. Right. So like, I, I don't even really care. I don't care whether they do it or if they don't do it. Right. And I taught myself how to write. I write other things. The thing I sold to History Channel was a Western. Was even a mob piece. Oh, that's cool, man. Like, Very yeah, cool. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything else like that. So, it, to me, I don't care. And I, like I said, like I taught myself how to train people. I worked with the top trainers in the in the world. Right. Um, I was there when he was, you know, training. He was training Manny Pacquiao. I worked for him when he trained Manny Pacquiao for Floyd Mayweather. I mean, look, I changed. I learned how to work. I'm not afraid of working, and right. I don't care about all the other stuff. So it's not important to me. That list, I'm famous for making sure all my lists on the ground. I was like always into, uh, you know, to like, you know, self help, Tony Robbins stuff. And right. I would accomplish my goals. I used to just have bad goals, not good goals. Right. I but now, now I have new goals. Right. But but what was cool was that you wrote that 14 years ago, and and right. and, and, and and it's like, and and I know at least for myself, it's hard for me to put things in the con text for myself because it's hard to kind of see what's going on you're dealing with yourself every day and you're dealing with external issues etc but when I looked at that and you know and we're friends on social media and I and you know I keep up with things that you do and I started kind of plugging things in I was like wow you know I really kind of have to bring that up because it's like those are like you know you know, short term to long term goals, but you compile them all back to back and just kind of going down the list. It's like, man, he accomplished all that. And, you know, you know, to, 
to some people, you know, they don't learn to appreciate the small things in life, but it's like those are things that you should be really proud of, you know? So I'm, I'm happy that I accomplished it. I'm happy that I work. But right. like I said, I changed my life. I surrendered myself. Couldn't have done it. You know, I'm a Christian. Right. And life works out for me. Very cool. It may not work for everyone else, but it works for me. Right. And, uh, you know, it works well, and, and I've accomplished a lot. I have a lot more that I want to accomplish. And hopefully it's part of God's will that I do, and I think I will. Right. And I want to get, like, I want to get my story out and uh, do what I can to just make others, like, know that there's hope. And there's more to, like, life than just trying, trying to make a lot of money. You know, you got you to gotta have personal satisfaction. you got to right. do the right thing. Happiness. You know, happiness. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're definitely living a positive existence. You know, it, it, it shows, you know, just by kind of keeping up with what you're doing and stuff. And uh, definitely your turnaround is inspiring to me. So, um, well, thank you, you know, That's so. what I, want. I, want, I want people to like know that you can change your life when you want to. Right. You know, it's not easy and you're going to have hard times, but hey, better than where you were. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Kenji, I really appreciate you, man, taking the time out of your day. Yeah, yeah, of course. You always.